the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are artist Gallist Goodell and composer, lecturer, musician Russell Steinberg. Painter Gallist Goodell was born in Nicosia, Cyprus, and raised in Lebanon during the war years. He moved to Armenia while it was still uh, under Soviet control, and he went to fine art school there. Then he came to the U.S. in 1975. What brought you to the uh, United States? What were you planning to do? Actually, uh, when the family immigrated to Armenia, my father realized that it was not the wisest decision that he could make because of the communist uh, domination at the time. So he went from Be Beirut? Um, or? From Cyprus to Armenia, then oh. from Lebanon. So oh, we went to Lebanon in order to start the immigration process oh, so to you come went, to the United States. You went from Cyprus to Armenia. Right. And oh, that's how we end up being part of the civil war at the time. You uh, were in every war. Uh, yes. <laughs> you were in everything, weren't you? That's true. And at one point, uh, actually, it was Lebanon which was very decisive for me to start to go into art because, uh, well, because it, the streets were dangerous, so I had to stay in indoor in order to be safe. So I started to paint there, and that's how basically it got more serious for me. And when we came here, I didn't stop. I kept on experimenting with various... Were there painters in your family? Was there any background of painting? Yes, actually my father has done in an amateur way, he has painted. Oh, so, so he was always... That's right. So when we were in Lebanon, his brushes and paints were available to me. So I only added a few colors to his uh, box, paint box. But what did you do? Did you have your school in your house? How did you go to school when you were there? Uh, I, I didn't go to school. I went only to uh, a language school where I can learn English because we were coming here. Oh. And that's, that was the only school. That's what I wondered if you spoke English when you got here. Uh, no, I got a lot of uh, schooling, <laughs> like both school and private lessons. Give us a little bit of a more taste of what it was like in Lebanon, because I was there and saw the Green Line and how kind of violent. Uh, For me, it, it was entirely violent. a new experience because I was bo I, I was raised in under Soviet uh, system, and uh, Lebanon was a very free co country. Oh. And it was entirely new culture for me, and the language was foreign. Uh, but it was something that I experienced, and it was important to have that kind of experiences in life, so it makes you a better person. Did the you end. see the fighting? Of course, of course. It was part of the life. It was part of the life? Time. Yeah. And then you talked about being in Soviet. I never even think about saying I was going to Russia or the Soviet and thinking of Armenia. But it's true, it was all part of the Soviet Union. Exactly, it was a communist country at the time. And how long were you there? We lived there about 10 years. Oh, you were there that long? Right. Oh, so what did you do there? What kind well, of lifestyle I, I, did we, you have? I went to school and I was very young at the time. And I, I had a good uh, childhood, I should say. Did you? Yes, it was a very, very good experience. So, so what, I've seen your work. I saw your work at uh, the Forest Lawn Museum, and it's very tough, it's very strong, and it seems that it's so uh, influenced by what you went through. Yes, uh, also having a, an Armenian background, which uh, I, can, I can say probably there was the influence of genocide as well. Oh, in besides the that, I didn't even think about yes. that, too. So it was, it was combination of all those experiences, both personal and whatever has come uh, from background. So it reflects, reflected in the art. Then later on, I started to do different groups of uh, works. Uh, I did war group because the country, our country 
has yeah. been in war last 10 years or so. So you, can, you cannot be indifferent. indifferent. And what, what work was up at that first show that I saw? It Boris was the Long. genocide group that it I did. It was a genocide yes. group. And then I did the bondage group. And this, this group uh, was born from that group because... What we're looking at here? Uh, yes. Uh, you Ooh, see, what I happened was... was bondage. <laughs> this is a portrait. Uh, no, I actually, learned. what happened was when I was doing the bondage group, I was not satisfied what uh, that uh, space was not enough for me. So I started to come out of the space. So at one point, I took uh, pe uh, tape and started to put the actual physicality of the painting the bondage. into bondage, yeah. taping the painting. When I did that, I realized that I was censoring the painting. I was not allowing the viewer mm -hmm. to see the whole thing because I was covering with uh, tape. Okay. But yeah. that's bondage, isn't it? Oh, right. You're covering parts of uh, the body, parts of whatever you're, exactly. you're taping. And then uh, that kind of opened a new perspective for me. I started to go to uh, Google News and take uh, the headlines from the news right on the canvas and then cover part parts with uh, paint mm. instead of uh, tape. What I was going to ask is what materials did you use? And you use an abundance of materials right. because the, the genocide were actually sculptures, weren't they? Actually, they were kind of digital collaging oh, because oh. I took heads and kind heads, of manipulated. Yeah. But did you have actual the head actually there? Yes, actually it I did, used... did, because I remember that. So I went, oh my gosh, this is so disturbing. That because they were very strong. Yes, uh, they were. And, and then basically that, uh, that started to grow step by step and uh, eventually got where I am now. But, but tell us about what you used when you said you used the heads and you used uh, different materials. It was materials. Uh, photography based. Yeah, uh, so collages, you used a, yeah. Those uh, heads that you saw, camera and printing machines, uh, canvas and paint. Uh, together, uh, I kind of... It um, came off the canvas, though, right? Uh, that's the feeling that you get, but actually they were on the canvas. They were? Because yes. they felt like they were like... That's right. Coming off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so little by little, it moved. As you can see, when I moved to another group, then another group, then finally... I got this bondage group that I, I mm -hmm. just mentioned. I also saw some of your work at the Harvard ha Harvest, Harvest Gallery. Ha yes. Harvest Gallery in Glendale. What uh, group was that? That was again uh, the first group that I did, the genocide group. Was it? It was uh, it, right. It somehow didn't seem as strong to me there as it did. Maybe the pieces were bigger in the first gallery, mm -hmm. and the that's right. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about some of the other work that we wanted to, to right. mention. Th that's the, the first one is the... Uh, is it going to be this one? Yes, that one it's is the, the one that I mentioned, the taped one. Uh -huh. And as you can see, the tape is covering part of the image. So when you're covering, you are denying the viewer that particular information. Ah, so, so I this was is censoring the first one, it's green, and you were censoring right. the... And then uh, the others uh, are the ones that I have taken the text from Google News and covered with paint. Now these, this would be like the second one that right. we're showing. And oh, so you have the text there. Right. And you use very strong brush strokes, very bright colors. That's right, because uh, I was kind of sugarcoating the grim reality that we have <laughs> in a way to, to pretend that it, uh, I'm happy. But that's the reality. But that's the reality. And, yeah. and when I did that, I realized that what I was uh, re uh, relating to is information. Because we are constantly bombarded with information. Ah. And the originator of the information tells us what they want us to oh, know. Well, we well, yes, but you're doing the same thing because you're closing right. off that's the That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. Uh, which one do we see? Okay, basically this, this, this one. one. When I did that one, someone uh, made a remark to me. He said, it, it's a powerful work. It looks like a graffiti, or is it? And that gave me an idea that I can use spray because... Oh, uh, the graffiti uh, that's and the right. spray cans? Exactly. And then you use spray cans on uh, this? Not here. Later on, I started to, to use spray uh, paint. Okay, and so I realized that spray paint has very unique uh, ability to give you this uh, uninterrupted energy. 
instead well, of taking the paint constantly and uh, applying to the surface. You just keep moving. That's right. And but you can see it on these. That's right. These Spray pieces. paint kind yeah. of gives you chance to flow the energy. Uh, to move quickly much and move the way you want to move That's without right. stopping. And I fell in love with the uh, with the medium. With the, I, <laughs> have you done yes. any buildings yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. You haven't been out at night, spring, <laughs> and I have yet. one more that I want to show. Uh, oh, th this uh, is great, the, oh, red right. and, the red and black one. And then I realized that, why don't I take the newspaper? At one point I introduced the newspaper, because a uh, newspaper already has contains the information that I am taking from the news. And when I did that, I started to cut the, the canvas and bend, uh, so basically that's the same idea. Which is what, you, it's what you're doing. So how do you describe your work? It's a, it's a, relationship, it, a relationship between uh, information, uh, uh, between facts and fiction, basically. From Be the very beginning, would you say? Like with the genocide pieces and the bondage pieces and now the spray cans? They, they brought me here. Those were the steps that you those grow. Those were the steps, and, and did you were those all called the same? Would you describe? No, no they, were they were different. So they were it, different. that's right. So those were different periods that I I had to go through in order to to get here. They're abstract, but they're really representational too. Because this this is fantastic. This is the first time I've seen this. So this is a portrait that Gallus did, and he's got the outline of the that's right the your profile profile and then when he was talking about bending you bent this back that's right and it's like the inside of me that's out. right basically uh, the, the first layer had your painting and then the second layer is kind of covering whatever there was originally uh, which is what you uh, like that's to right. do so and that you're hiding something uh, exactly as politicians do as uh, <laughs> Corporations to advertise constantly. They don't tell bad things about their product. They say good things so we can go and buy. And they hide what, what there's there, too. That's right. right? What about um, all the material used on here? Because there's like some really gooey stuff. Actually, coming up the, of this. the surface, the texture that you see is oil paint. Oh. It's very thick oil paint. And then I also I have used spray on this. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so there are various materials. I never limit myself on the material because uh, sky is the limit. You should be able to use anything you, that you think. What is about needed. archivally speaking? Do you ever worry about that? Well, these are good. These are traditional materials. Yeah. Yes, I, I do <laughs> consider the life expectancy of the painting of the work. So would you um, ever have a chance to go back? Did you go back to si uh, Nicosia or to no, Beirut or to Yerevan? Uh, I have been in Yerevan since we have come, but uh, that's it. It was the early years of independence, oh, right. and it was not a happy time. It was not a happy memory for me. But it was not. No, it was, it was very difficult for, for the people who were living there. But now I hear good things, and I am happy. That the life has so what them. you've recreated are your own times, and if you went, but maybe if you went back now, it would be totally <laughs> different too. What your paintings would come out? You never know, because basically what we express is our life experiences, exactly, and they influence our what what we produce. I thank you so much for coming today and for talking to us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And we'll be right back with musician Russell Steinberg. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with composer, lecturer, teacher, conductor, Russell Steinberg. I'm sure there's more uh, that goes before his name, but we'll continue. He was born and raised in Los Angeles. He earned a Bachelor of Arts at UCLA, a Master's in Music from the New England Conservatory, and a PhD from Harvard. And he looks so young, and he's so smart, and I can't believe he's done all of this in his life. How did you get involved with music? Was it in your family? Uh, it was only in my family slightly. <laughs> um, I, think, I think I really got involved with music possibly because of television. 
Uh, I think when I saw those Leonard Bernstein Young People's Concerts, that was really oh. what changed my life, starting starting with those, seeing, seeing Leonard Bernstein conduct the uh, Beethoven's Fifth. How old were you? I was very young. You know, they were read broadcasts. Yeah, but I mean, like yeah. six or seven? Yeah, or? no, about seven or eight. I came late to music. You really did? Yeah, and very you know late. so much. Were you playing the piano at, at that age? I was just starting to play the piano, yeah. Oh, and then watching Leonard Bernstein... I think Did I it fell... inspire you to be a conductor or a composer? You see, that's, that's kind of what makes me different. I, I think I liked Leonard Bernstein, but it wasn't <laughs> Leonard Bernstein I liked. It was Beethoven. Oh, it was and Beethoven. And so I don't think I fell in love with Leonard Bernstein. I fell in love with the music. And so he, he provided me that gateway, and that music really started to change my life. I always tell people my, my life changed when I was sorting baseball cards. <laughs> Move to music? <laughs> I was sorting baseball cards as a kid, and I had... Back in those days, right, record players, remember those record, things? Yeah. And when you got you to the, the end, well, you put the needle on, and when you got to the end, if you didn't pick it up, it would sometimes go on auto uh -huh. and go over and over and over. Oh, so, so that part of the record, of Leonard Bernstein's record, started with the second movement, the slow movement. And or at least it kept going back to that. So I heard it over and over. Now, as a young kid, you usually aren't interested in the slow music. But uh, I started as I was sorting... Carl Yastrzemski and whoever, Don Dry, I don't remember who I had. Don Drysdale. <laughs> and, Bo and Beethoven. Wishing I had Koufax, probably. Was and he, was he yeah. on a card? He well, wasn't, he wasn't on a card, card, but I heard that music, and it started to move me to tears. And I think that changed my life. Because it's like such a contrast, yeah. talking about yes. Beethoven and baseball cards. Yes, well, so is living B -B -B. in Los Angeles. <laughs> B, 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 B. I'm, that's yeah. great. Yeah, because so, I grew up out here, so I'm, I'm very much an, an, an L.A. boy, and so it was not part of our of our culture. So once you started and you decided you wanted to be in music, did, did you like pour yourself into your piano? Or what did you do? Yeah, that's what happened. You I poured did. myself into piano, but first I started to write music. Oh, you did? And I think that was when I was transformed. Well, what was your composing inspiration? How could you write music? Well, when you first created your, your first creation, how, what, what was, was that happening with you? I was writing a story. Okay. And that's what you were doing? And what's, what story? inspired you to do that story? Um, probably the fact, something around you. Yeah, something spurred you, but then it fo focused you, right? And you got into a focus where you right. lost the world. And that's what you did? Well, that's what happened. My parents left for about an afternoon. I think I had like six hours <laughs> on my own. <laughs> So I wrote a concert. The Lonesome Duck. <laughs> and, and how did you compose? Just from in your head? Well, I think I used the piano, and then I, you know, I was young, and I, I think, I, but I, it was very important to me, and this is kind of an interesting thing for today, 2000. It was very important to me to write it down. I don't think that's something people today think about, but it's very important use, for me to set it down. How did you? Well, write staff it? paper. Did you on staff yeah. paper? I, you know, I was semi-literate at that time, so. But that, yeah. I mean, you can yeah. be literate, and I wouldn't know how to write on yeah. staff paper. Well, take, when you first do it, it takes some practice. You make a lot of mistakes, <laughs> and uh, you know, I still remember seeing Mozart's first composition. Uh, they have it under glass in Salzburg, and it's just so amazing to see because you know, he wrote it, I think, you know, five years old, four or five years old. It's a piano piece, and if you can read music, you can hear it. It's an incredible piece, but he couldn't control the pen. You know, there's all kinds of jiggles and jitters and everything. Boy, yeah, right? it's just he's unbelievable. Yeah, so I certainly wasn't on that level, but I, I, I did that with pencil. And you've con continued to compose. You just yes. did something on Daniel Pearl. Yes. Tell me yes. about that. Yes. When the, somebody commissioned you, yeah. was it a commission? That was a commission. That was a very powerful experience because I got to meet Daniel Pearl's parents. And, his widow? Uh, and, uh, no, I didn't meet his widow. Oh. She's in New York. Oh, she but I is. met his, his mom and dad who live here and actually in Encino. Incredible oh. people. Um, his father's a musician but also a highly regarded uh, uh, computer scientist. Oh, so how did yeah. you get the commission? It, by way of uh, New Hampshire. <laughs> from here to there to back up. I met this wonderful filmmaker who was at the McDowell Colony. I was on a, on a writing retreat at the McDowell Colony, one of the finest uh, resident uh, art colonies in the United States, in fact. In and, New Hampshire. Yeah, New Hampshire. And, I, uh, and so I met Aviva Kempner there, a wonderful uh -huh. filmmaker. And uh, she had just been talking with the Pearls, and she felt we might be a good fit. Oh. So that's why I And it, it was came. a good fit. Well, I called him up. I called them up. I had a phone number. That's all I had. And I said, I started to talk, and they said, we don't talk to reporters. And he was just about to hang up. Was he? And for the only time in my life, I, the words, I'm a composer, didn't result <laughs> in, the, in the door being slammed in my face. But <laughs> when you do something like that, yeah. where, do, where does, is it heard? 
well, it, we had to figure out once I performed it, once I composed it, where we were going to get it heard. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, he, the Daniel Pearl Foundation has concerts all over the world. Oh. So we, we started, he, they first put me in touch with a performer who became one of my absolute best friends, Mitchell Newman of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and we started performing it all what around. What does he play? He's a violinist. He's a violinist. Yeah. So when you write something like this, do you ha you know Daniel Pearl, you've met his parents. Well, you, I didn't you, know him. No, but, but I mean, yeah. you, you knew about yeah. him. Uh -huh. And does that conjure yeah. up violin or flute or something? How do, how do you get the instrument? I tried to make it about him. You know, when people die, especially something tragic that made world news like that, there's a tendency to just want to write elegiac music. But when I went to their house, after I, they didn't hang up with me, <laughs> and it was, it was kind of late at night because I'm a night owl, and they said, uh, he said, Mr. Pearl said, why don't you come over? And he found out I lived close by. Uh -huh. So I went over. We spent a long part of the evening there just laughing laughing because they told me so many funny stories and so I said well, if I write something oh, I it's got to be about the way this this person loved life oh so that's yeah. how that was the inspiration and that was a violin well no you. it started it then okay. then he gave me a book the Wall Street Journal book which was uh, at home in the world collection of all of Danny's articles I and see. I learned that Danny was a violinist Oh. and Danny played in youth orchestras here in Los Angeles oh. and so I found he took his violin and his fiddle I mean his fiddle and his guitar I think it made mandolin wherever he went and that's how he met people to do stories but that's so yeah. pertinent isn't it yes so so you can always find something to to put your finger on when you're composing well you can't always but I really it was really important for me that the piece be reflect something real about his life um, I'm going to jump, jump because you <laughs> talked about his playing in youth yeah. orchestras and you have a youth orchestra that you that's, conduct that's right. for. Tell us about that. How old are they? How mm -hmm. large is the group and where is it? Sure. I conduct the Los Angeles Youth Orchestra, which is a group that I helped found about 10 oh. years ago. Oh. And it is, uh, I'm very proud of this organization because it has kids from all over the city. And the reason they can come from all the, over the city is that we do it on Sundays. That's when we rehearse. And so that's one day that the traffic is semi-reasonable. And, and where is it? We hold rehearsals right now at Milken Community High School, which is right across from the Skirball Cultural Center. And, and how do you pick these? Do you, uh, do you audition? We do auditions, but it's very important for me that we're as inclusive as possible. And I think one reason we have such a wide demographic and a wide, uh, I mean, we have kids from every background you can imagine. It's very class. diverse and cultural. Our only requirement diverse. is they have to have two years of private lessons on their instrument. And, uh, and, then, and then they audition, and, is, and then as long as they're able to do that, they enter the, to the orchestra. From what age to what age? Roughly 8 to 18. And once they get to 18, they're... Usually you're in college. Re you're, you're, re <laughs> you're replenishing It's a the constant group? recycling is it experience. All the time? But I got to tell you, Joan, just, uh, just last week I went to a concert at UCLA and I sat down and then there next to me was this very tall boy who uh, was in the UCLA Honors String Quartet about to graduate and uh, he was my very little violinist when he was in You're the group kidding. just about four or five years ago. So he followed his passion yes. all the way through. No, he discovered his passion. He didn't know he wanted to be a musician. When it he was came just, to you, he didn't know? No, it was just in his last year in the orchestra. I think he was going into math or science and suddenly something clicked. It was really beautiful to see that. No, those stories happen a lot. How many do you have? We have about 90 kids, 80 to 90 kids. And do you know them all individually? You must. I'm, no, I do not know them as well as I should because we work hard. So we don't have a lot of time to socialize, but I do get to know a good number of them. Like for instance, this next concert, yeah, April, April 1st and 2nd, is going to feature a flutist we have who's graduating. And she is really unusual. She's been blind since birth. And blind musicians are very common, but not in an orchestra, because how are you going to oh. follow the baton? How do you? Well, we had to invent it. So she found someone, one person in the West Coast who transcribes music into Braille. So she, first of all, <laughs> how did she take lessons on the flute? Is that more difficult than, say, the piano or something no, like that? No, no, not, not more difficult, but she had to do everything by ear. So think about orchestra music. Well, you, she you did sit, it by ear, yeah, right? You, well, she, and then she has to. Yeah, she has to have someone. She has her teacher record the part, and I then she has some a part of the part written out in Braille, so I she see. can read it that way. But she, different than other kids, she has to memorize the spaces in between the music. 
You sit with me in concerts. You, you, you see how many times those wind players just sit there doing nothing? I know, and I don't know what everybody's doing. I, I sit behind you sometimes, and yeah. it's like, what is, what is Russell thinking? I'm always going like, what does Russell think about what just happened? <laughs> well, what I think about, I don't know, but what, I'll tell you what the wind players are thinking. I better not screw up and come in late. <laughs> <laughs> and so Kira, Kira has, to, has to memorize all of those places and figure out when to come in. And then we have to have someone tap her gently for entrances so that oh, she can that be... Oh, is that how they do it? That's, no, that's how they do it. That's how that's we're how inventing it. That's how you do it. That's how you it's do it. It's a very interesting process. We're very proud of her. So what do they play? The orchestra? Yeah. Oh, what, the music? Youth, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, well, we have two groups, two levels. And the top level does the same repertoire you hear at the Philharmonic. You know, we, we're doing Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. Uh, oh. Wonderful piece, Mozart's Don Giovanni, and Kira's going to. This is her last year, so she, we're going to feature her in a solo piece. I've arranged. Then I have a, the younger orchestra does arranged pieces. I do, uh, including Mendelssohn and um, you know d different, different, uh, different. See, they have to Bartok they go home and, and like learn that. it all. You no, give they it have to go them. home and learn it, and then we work very hard. I work with one orchestra on stage, and the other orchestras and sectionals with very wonderful trained coaches. And that's all on Sundays. Yes. So yes. you're like really intense Very on intense. Sundays. Yeah, they're Sundays. That's one reason I admire these kids so much. They're taking one of their only free days and they're working harder in that day than they do in most school you're days. You're a director at the Stephen Weiss Music Academy. Yes. Is that right across the street? Yeah, that's, Is, that's, a, that's associated with the Milken Community oh, with High the Milken, School. Right. And that's the music program that I, that I began there. And, and so, so do you still go to do you I'm work still there? teaching there. In you fact, today, the, today I was just teaching advanced placement music theory. Oh, you do. You know, so how is, often you know. do you work there? Well, you know, so I work there on half the days. And then, you know, you've seen me doing concert lectures. And Which I compose. Which is fabulous at Disney Hall. Yeah. You're fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. And one thing. My audiences are great. Before we leave, how can we keep this uh, music alive? Because this is really important. And yeah. everyone doesn't have the ability to know you or to be excited by what you do or how you teach? Oh, I'm easy. You go on my website and you can, you can get all that material. That's I very know, easy. I know, that's great because you have a series at Milken. Well, I have a series at Milken and I put a lot of information on the site. I've been taping some of my lectures. But I think it's great to do that. And but taping, I wanna, you can but what I want to talk to you about that's so important, everyone talks about keeping classical music right, alive. That's right. One thing that I don't hear people focus on are the listeners. You know, I'm a composer. Writing music is very important to me. And I started to realize people can't hear Beethoven. So how are they going to hear my music? And I think that one important thing about keeping music alive is helping people who listen have a comfortable context for it. Because you've got to get rid of the intimidation and the jargon, but you also have to get rid of superficiality. Well, that's you why you need someone young and interesting, speaking well, to get you excited about it. Well, Leonard Bernstein did that for me. Well, that's and I so think that I think that I think we in America really need that because we don't <laughs> carry those traditions in the same way. We're a star. We're a star-oriented culture. Yeah, that's why I was asking, yeah. and that's why I wanted you to tell the audience, and you yeah. did. And I thank you for coming oh, today. What a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Keep writing to seven 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 South Figueroa, forty fourth floor, Los Angeles nine zero zero one seven. And my email, J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 -N at AOL.com. And thanks, Russell. A real pleasure to be here, John. And thanks, Raul, for directing today. Good morning.